Hey YouTube, so this is uh, Prepared Grunt again. Um, here to give you an example of how to prepare your soil for a garden. Whether you're preparing it for a flower garden, whether you're preparing it for a vegetable garden. There are slightly different things you do for different plants, but this is a good baseline. So the first thing I usually do is, as you can see, we've got a nice mix going right here. Um, and I'll show you what this mix is. Basically, I can tell you it's peat moss, manure, and compost mixed with native soil. So here's our native soil. Here's the garden we're working in. This is a flower garden that my wife and I are cutting out to go around the tiny home that we're building. So you can see in here, we've got examples of purple clay, white clay, and red clay. Fantastic soil for a garden. Doesn't like to let water out. Clay tends to like to hold the water and keep it in almost like a clay pot. It just kind of sits there for a while. It will eventually seep out, but it takes a while. Not, it, it usually takes longer than what plants roots really like. So what we're doing is we're taking some of that native soil, getting it broke up, getting it pulled out. First thing we do, Take off about the first inch to two inches of soil so that you got this nice patch. You can see right there, not a whole lot to it, not super thick, just enough to get all that crap off. So we've taken that off. Now, mind you, I pre staged this <laughs> so that it would be that easy. It's, it's a little bit of a trick. You have to lay the shovel down and kind of kick along underneath. But that's what you want to do. You want to get that top layer off first. Once you've got that top layer off, you get it broken up. Again, you saw it was kind of pre-staged, broken up. And you're going to shovel a good amount into your mix. soil type is, you want to bring that natural native soil into that mix because it does allow your roots to get introduced to that soil before they break out underneath and wherever through your garden. Especially if you're doing something like trees where you know the tree is going to be there long enough that it's definitely going to have roots that grow out beyond your garden line or beyond your planting line, you want a good amount of that native soil mixed in so that once that root gets outside of that planting area, that planting zone, it's not in shock going, whoa, what happened? And the root's dying off because it can't figure out how to dig through that soil and pull the nutrients that it needs. And so by doing that, by getting that mixed in there like that, it gives that plant a chance to kind of get a little bit used to how to pull nutrients from the soil without overwhelming it by that's all that it has to do so that it gives that plant a chance to get larger and everything like that. So you'll see, I'm going through, breaking up these clumps a little bit. Doesn't have to be dust, but you do want smaller patches. If you've got sandy soil, you still want to introduce that sandy soil to it. Um, again, for the same reasons, it gives that root a chance to meet that before it gets out of its planting zone and you get it mixed in. You see big patches of root, go ahead and pull them out. You don't have to pull every single root out. You just want good patches like that. Kind of try and break the soil off of it. Get it out. For the most part, most of those roots should have come out with that top layer. Most of the roots that are going to continue to grow anyways. 
most of these roots will become compost later on. So you get them mixed in real well. Now today I'm actually using bagged compost because the compost bin that I've gotten started here, you see something like this, you definitely want to get it out. If that's a grass root, it will grow no matter what size it is. Today, I'm using, so going back to what I was talking about, today I'm using bagged compost because the compost bin that I'm starting isn't big enough to pull from yet. Um, it's still too young, but what I look for, I don't tend to go for the higher brand name stuff. I look for things that tell me exactly what's in it. So like right here, it says cow manure and compost. So it, al it also tells me it's 0.05% nitrogen, 0.05% phosphate, 0.05% potash, um, and then 1% chlorine. Now, you want those. Your nitrogen, phosphate, and potassium, MPP, are the most important things to a plant. Potash can also be gotten from things like um, the ash from a fireplace or a fire pit. If you use a fireplace for your heat, you can mix that ash into that into your compost. Now, one thing you have to keep in mind, the more of that ash you throw into your compost, the more acidic your soil is gonna become. So, if you have highly acidic, you know, plants that like highly acidic soil, for example, pepper plants, um, tomato plants, things like those, they really enjoy highly acidic soil and they bear better fruits, spicier peppers, juicier tomatoes, whenever the soil is more acidic. Whereas you have things like asparagus, okra, um, those don't really like as acidic of the soil. So with those, you don't want to add as much potash. Now what you can do is you can add things like calcium and things like that to bring your levels, your acidity levels back down. So if you have, you know, one big compost bin and you know it's going to be more acidic because you're throwing huge amounts of potash in there from the winter time, that's fine. As you mix it into the soil, you know, as you mix it into whatever your gardening area is, if you know it's a plant that you're going to put there that's doesn't like that higher acidity take some uh, shell um, some shell grounds or something like that something with a higher calcium level mix it into that soil you know you always want to do level tests chemical tests on your soil to find out what your levels are at but mix things like that in there eggshells have a high calcium so if you're mixing eggshells in with your compost, that's also going to help bring the acidity level down. Things like that. So what I do is you saw me mix in the um, native soil. Now I'm taking the compost. Now your percentage rates, that doesn't really matter as much. I mean, it does to an extent, but don't focus so much on it has to be, you know, some gardeners want to say it has to be 10% native soil, 40% uh, compost, and 60% or 50% uh, peat moss. The percentages vary with every soil. So if you have sandy soil, you're going to want more peat moss. If you have clay soil, you're going to want less peat moss because what, you know, so you have to really judge it off of your soil type. 
So like with my soil, I have clay, so I want less peat moss um, mixed in. I still want peat moss, but I want less peat moss mixed in. So I'm going to increase the amounts of native soil and the amounts of compost and put less peat moss. So, and I'll get on to what the peat moss does here in a second. So I'm mixing in the manure and compost. Now, here's the curse of using bagged compost. Some of this stuff I'm seeing in here, you see right there. That's a piece of what used to be OSB board. It's got the paint on it. It's still wood, so it's still organic material, but you have to watch out for stuff. Um, basically what they did was they chopped up some OSB that wasn't being used anymore. You see another piece right there. You can tell by the blue paint on it. Um, so you, you have to watch out for that stuff. You don't always know exactly what's gonna be mixed into that compost. Now, because it is still wood, it is still organic material, it, is, it will break down around your plants and keep your plants good and healthy. So, but I have found times where I found pieces of glass in these things. I found plastic. You have to watch out for it. Um, because if there's plastic or glass, obviously you want to get that out. You don't want to find that while you're digging around in your, you know, with your hands. That's why a lot of people always say wear gloves. I don't like to wear gloves. I don't like to wear gloves for hardly anything. Um, I like to feel what I'm doing. So, um, but you get all this dumped in here. You even find big clumps. You can break those big clumps up. Now we're going to move on to the peat moss. So, peat moss, this is the peat moss that we're using. You can see in here, it does have little chunks of wood in it as well. That's okay, that's good. Wood is good, wood breaks down. Basically what peat moss is, is peat moss is a medium. A lot of times there's different things that they make it out of. You can get coconut shell peat moss that's made out of that little fibrous hair stuff on coconuts. Um, you can get it out of all kinds of different things, but it's just basically it's a medium that helps hold moisture into the soil. So that's why I say with my clay soil, I don't want as high of a percentage of peat moss because my soil already acts as a clay pot. <laughs> It'll sit there and hold the moisture in there and doesn't let it drain out as much. Now, what the peat moss does by going ahead and mixing peat moss in here is it keeps a balance of moisture throughout the soil instead of all the moisture sitting at the bottom and the soil at the top completely dries out this helps keep a balance of moisture throughout the soil which helps keep your plants a little healthier um, and it also equalizes the moisture between the plants so i'm gonna get a fair amount of peat moss in here. Again, not as high of a percentage as if I was mixing it with sand. If I was mixing it with sand, I would put a whole, whole bunch of peat moss in here. And I know it looks like a lot because I'm spreading it out, but I promise it's not. Um, that was a 40 pound bag of compost. I didn't even put five pounds of peat moss in here. So, um, now I'm just getting it mixed throughout. So you're getting it chopped up, you can get that clay mixed in there, getting it all spread around. You want it mixed really well. So that that peat moss is spread throughout. You also want that compost to be spread really well throughout so that your um, plants get a good spread, you know, a good nutrient base inside, you know, around their roots, inside the soil around the roots.
Another thing you can do with this, it's a, it's a personal touch that I like to always add, is I like living soil. It's again, that's why I'm mixing in native soil to my mix, is adding in things like um, worms. Worms are a really good way of breaking down some of this excess organic material like, you know, the wood and the other small bits of things that are in here. But adding worms in is a really good way of um, just keeping your soil living. And it helps to bring back a lot of the microbiome that naturally live in soil. Now, once you get a good mix going in a garden or something like that, at some point you do want to start avoiding tilling, um, which is turning the soil a whole lot. Doing a small turn at the beginning of a planting season, that's okay. Um, when you're first starting a garden, don't worry about it. You're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna affect the microbiome too heavily. But once you get a good living soil that you've created, that's your mix, you do want to turn and mix in new nutrients, fresh nutrients every season. But you want to, you don't want to completely dig it out and mix it in a bowl and then put it all back because that will disrupt your living soil. Um, mixing in, you know, taking and mixing in compost from your compost bin, just spreading the compost along the top and then kind of taking a shovel and gently turning, that's not going to hurt your microbiome. That's not going to hurt your living soil. But digging it all up and completely flipping it over will affect your um, living soil. So that's one thing that you want to think about. And the better your microbiome, your uh, living soil is, the stronger your plants are going to come out and the better flowers you'll get, the better fruits you'll get, um, even the better vegetables that you'll get. So, and one quick difference that I'll point out is a fruit is something that you remove, the, you remove from the plant. A vegetable is the plant. So, um, I, I like to specify that because I've had a lot of people look at me and say that a pepper plant is not a fruit or a, a tomato is not a fruit. Yes, they are. Those are both fruits. Um, a fruit is something that you remove from the plant. The vegetable is the plant itself. So even technically beans are considered fruits because you're not eating the plant. Whereas asparagus is a vegetable because you're taking and chopping off and that is the plant that you're eating. So. As always, um, you know, as always, take care of one another and uplift everybody. Have a great day.